My guest today is Kato Schur. Kato, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. What do you do for a living, Kato? <laughs> So I'm the developer advocate at Viverica. So um, it's a German-based company, and we wrote and maintain the open source Apache project, uh, Flink, as well as a related platform called Viverica Platform. Let's talk about Flink. What, what is Flink? So Flink is a stateful stream processing engine, and I can get into more of what that is in a moment. Um, it's a little confusing because now we also have unified streaming and batch capabilities. So it actually does both, but it's foremost known as a stream processing engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rough translation of Flink in German means nimble. So that kind of highlights the flexibility and speed of the framework. Um, essentially, one of its strong points is it can handle just mass amounts of data coming through super fast, you know, low latency, high throughput. So that's really kind of its, uh, its strengths there. Um, it also was built to address a lot of the common challenges that come with stream processing. So being able to provide things like high availability, various other safeguards, and exactly once guarantees um, that can also scale up, which is pretty, which is my favorite, personally my favorite feature. So yeah, now, can you just define stream processing for those that don't know? Yeah, so essentially, uh, stream processing is sort of a way of defining. Um, so basically, you have batch processing, which is sort of the traditional way of processing data. And in batch processing, you would have a single batch of data that goes through and then you stop, and then it goes through and then you stop. And so the benefits of batch processing are that you, you know, if you have any issue, if you have any data loss, any duplication or anything, you can just stop everything. There's natural points where it stops and you can revise the data, you can look at it. You're not really gonna get back pressure. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit easier to manage in some ways and that's kind of how we process data for uh, a pretty long time. But with streaming, the benefits of streaming are that a lot of data actually comes in in a stream processing format anyway. So if you're looking at weather sensor readings, you know, you want to know what the temperature is right now. You don't want to have to wait and say, you know, oh, it changed or video games. If you're in a video game, you don't want to stop and be like, oh, I, you know, um, I shot the bad guy and then sit there, you know, OK, now I got the feedback that, you know, the other character had this action. It's more um, real time. Mm -hmm. reactions. Exactly. Yeah. So we want to get as near real time as possible. And this is particularly important for things like fraud detection, where you want that, you know, if something bad happened, you want to know that something happened with your data as fast mm -hmm. as possible and you don't want to have to wait. Very cool. Uh, so what's, um, what, what are some uses, use cases where we would actually use Flink? Yeah, we'd use Flink. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, fraud detection is a really big one. So the thing with Flink is it's very flexible. It's very customizable. So when people ask us what our use cases are, um, I have a little bit of trouble answering that question sometimes because I just start going off in this list and it gets really long. So I'm like, okay, how much time do you have? Um, and I get really excited because we have some really awesome, unique use cases where people are saying, oh yeah, I figured out how to manipulate this customization and do this just really interesting, totally new thing over here. And we get a lot of that, which is really exciting, mm. but it does make it a bit hard to answer that question. But I would say the majority as in uh, the most common of, you know, even if it's only 30 or 40, 50% of our use cases, um, because everything else is so unique, uh, most of what we have is we have a lot of people in fintech. So as I mentioned, the fraud and anomaly detection is really big because Flink is able to not only provide as near real time as possible, but also maintain very granular data accuracy. So with fraud detection, not only do you want your data fast, but you, you can't afford for it to be wrong. So you want to have that exactly once guarantee where if you have data coming through and there's a problem and you do need to go back and kind of redo part of that stream, you don't want duplicate data. Um, you know, you don't want to charge someone twice or you don't want to show an anomaly come up twice because the whole point is that it's anomaly detection. So it's something that's unusual. So you want that pattern to be super accurate and you want to make sure you're not losing any data, but still getting it in as near real time as possible. So um, most of what people use us for is for that, which also includes uh, machine learning, um, you know, AI, and especially for analytics, it's very, very big for analytics. Yeah. Um, is it, uh, now, now it's an engine that allows you to process streaming data, but is, where does the data store? Does, does Flink provide that database or does it connect to existing databases? 
So yeah, so typically people would connect to a separate database. Um, so Flink is a stateful stream processing engine. So we do store state uh, locally. And, and you can also store it externally if you want as well. And, um, but that's going to be more like a, a snapshot. Um, we call it something different, but essentially that's going to be all your metadata. Um, that's going to help with things like um, rollbacks or if there's any issues, uh, if you want to test two different versions and things like that. But for the data itself, um, there's a lot of different connectors and it pretty much can hook up to any external database um, or local database that you have. And a lot of, uh, Flink actually has a lot of those connectors built in, which is kind of cool. And then there's also other databases we've worked with that have their own connectors. And so it's a pretty easy hookup system. You mentioned scalability. How is that implemented in Flink? Yeah, so a lot of that depends on, Flink has a very unique save pointing and checkpointing system. And this is actually what kind of fuels a lot of the features that we're known for. So um, it's mentioned a lot when, uh, as I, I keep talking about exactly once because it's my favorite feature. Um, but essentially how that works is you, um, if you have a pipeline and you have your data stream coming in, um, what it does, so a lot of different stream processing engines do exactly once. Um, but it doesn't always scale because of how it's implemented. So how we implement it with Flink is that um, we, we kind of almost mimic batch processing in a way where we have these checkpoints and save points throughout the stream. And we use watermarks in order to delineate like, okay, here's different points in the stream. And if there's an issue, you can very quickly go back and reread just that one section of data. And the cool thing is it doesn't really stop your stream. So you can still have the stream keep going. So you have the benefit of stream processing, but also the benefit of batch processing in the fact that um, you get that same data. And because you just drop everything between the last saved checkpoint, um, that means you're not going to get duplications. You're going to reread just that section and then just push, just push that right through. And the cool thing about that is a lot of different systems don't really do it that way. So they'll reread twice or they'll, they'll store it in a different way. And so with other systems, with other stream processing engines, you can end up with a bit more buildup. It's harder to scale. And this is something that tends to be hard to show in things like proofs of concepts, because when we compare Flink with other um, similar stream processing engines, if you're not processing very much data, the exactly once feature and that scalability or uh, exactly once uh, process is going to look about the same. It's going to have the same latency, the same throughput as a lot of the similar stream processing engines. But as soon as you start putting in tons and tons more data, which is why I really encourage people, if you're doing a proof of concept, to use something like DataGen or Faker or something where you can just get a mass amount of data. Um, doesn't have to be your data, but again, that's why I like using one of those systems and really test at a super high throughput. Because if you're just testing like, okay, you know, I have this like this local batch of data in this little database here, you're going to get kind of the same results. But what where Flink really shines is with the scalability. And that's because of that checkpointing and save pointing system is that it's able to go through so quickly. And that's and the scalability is where you see that come into effect. So uh, it sounds like the checkpointing would also be implemented or important in um, uh, error handling. If something goes wrong. Yes. And yeah, absolutely. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's especially useful, um, as I mentioned, for anomaly detection, because because of the watermarks and the checkpointing system, you're able to hone in really, really quickly on exactly where that anomaly or where that error is, um, which is also why Flink is used a lot for um, analytics and for people even use it as error detection um, adjacent to other streams as well, too. So and we've seen people do these cool things where they get like, uh, a Flink stream of just their data. So it's like, okay, here's like our customer data and then a whole separate Flink stream of just, here's us analyzing that stream with this other stream and everything's just going by really fast. And it's, I love seeing people do things like that. Very cool. Can you walk me through the, the experience of using Flink? Is there something I have to install mm -hmm. first? Is there code that I have to write? What, what does it look like? Yeah, so it depends how you want to start Flink. So if you, so we have our you know regular Flink, which is based in Java or Scala, Scala, and then we also have um, PyFlink, which is a separate UDF for using Flink with Python. And so if you want to do, if you're if you're already using one of those languages and you want the like full customization of Flink itself, you want a super deep dive. People will usually start with that. However. Um, I am a huge fan of Flink SQL. It makes things a lot easier. It abstracts a lot of the uh, complexity 
because uh, Flink is a very, you know, as I mentioned, it's a very high power stream processing engine, so it can get complex, um, especially because it's intended to address a lot of very complex issues with stream processing. And so with Flink SQL, having some of that abstracted away, especially if you're just getting started, is a really nice way to um, get those proofs of concepts going, find out if it's really going to fit your use case, and then if you want to, then you can build in the uh, Java and Scala and Python Flink into that, um, or you can just continue using Flink SQL for most use cases. You can get very granular with it. Um, and the Flink SQL, it's language agnostic, so any language that you're coding in. Um, I also particularly like it because it's a lot more friendly if you're uh, DevOps or if you know, you're know you not like a super deep dive Java person. So that's what I would recommend personally. If you're just kind of mm. getting into it, you want to play around with it, you just want to see what capabilities it has and be able to just jump right into the deep end without a lot of overhead. Um, and you do, even with Flink SQL, you do still need to install Java 8 or 11 uh, on mm -hmm. your machine or just make sure it's installed. And I know a lot of times I say that and people are like, but you promise I didn't have to write Java. And uh, I do promise if you're doing Flink SQL, you do not need to write Java um, or Scala, but you do just need it because um, some of Flink SQL is uh, based on the Java heap. So. Got it. Uh, is, yeah. When you install uh, Flink itself, is that something that I install on my server or is that something that's out in the cloud somewhere? How, how does that work? Yeah, so um, you, most of the time, yeah, you would st install it on your machine. Um, I There are some exciting things coming up that will make my answer to that different that I unfortunately can't tell you about yet. Okay, <laughs> um, so stay tuned. Uh, you can check out uh, Viverica Data on Twitter. There'll be some interesting announcements about that coming up soon. But yeah, currently you would install it on your machine and you literally you just make sure you have Java 8 or 11 installed locally. And then you just, it's just like a, you can either do the binary file or download the Flink, sna uh, Flink snapshot. And so that's just on the Flink website. It's like a three step process. Um, uh, I actually have, I've live coded it a couple times in talks and it, you know, it takes like maybe five minutes or less to even okay. just have everything load up on there. All right. Uh, you, said, you mentioned right at the start, this is an open source project, but it's mm -hmm. run by a company. What's, what's the licensing model? How, how does Everco make their money? Yeah. So, um, so Flink, as I said, yeah, is open source entirely. So it's owned by the Apache Software Foundation. So all uh, Flink licensing is through Apache. So it's going to be the exact same as any other Apache project. And then Viverica, the company that wrote and maintains it, they have a separate platform that does a lot of the more enterprise level things that a lot of, like if you'd want, if you're at a bigger company, um, even smaller companies, because it's going to help you with a lot of deployments. It's going to help it connect with other, uh, the rest of your tooling, um, help with analytics. So there's a lot in the Viverica platform that boosts Flink and makes it easier and makes it really kind of rise to that enterprise level. It gives you that support that you need if you're using it in production at a really high scale. And so that's where, and there is a free version. So there's a community free version of the Viverica platform. Um, that's usually what I use when I'm introducing it to people because um, it's you know just really easy to jump in and try it out. Um, and then there's you know levels uh, as you go up from there as well. Um, okay, so there is a free version and a paid version of Viverica's product, yeah. product, but Flink itself is always free. Is that is that yeah. a fair statement? Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and because it's open source, are people contributing to this? People out of the community? Yeah, yeah, and that's one of my one of the things that actually really drew me to Flink is that when I first started working with it, we, my team at the company that I first did Flink with had the whole company had basically never done very much stream processing at all. Most people never heard of Flink, and we just jumped right into it. And to have that experience of jumping into this new technology that was so totally new to my whole company and be able to just be like, hey, this one thing doesn't work for our like kind of weird, like we had a really weird use case. Um, and you'd be able to just say, you know, hey, I, I put together this little patch and within... And this was like years and years ago, and it was still just like, you know, within a couple of days or so, we had that push through and we were able to have that, um, that PR approved and use it, you know, on wow. within, the, within the project. And so that was really exciting for me. And that's what really actually got me hooked is that open source community. We have one of the most active mailing lists in the Apache Foundation. And uh, we also now have a Slack space. Um, so that's been something that's been really exciting for me is to see uh, the one thing is it's very hard to keep up with because uh, sometimes people are like, oh yeah, what's, what are people working on right now? And it's like, well, 
let me scroll through all the all the PRs and uh, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty exciting to see that. Very cool. So you actually were a, you were a customer of this product and you mm -hmm. liked it so much you went and joined yep. the company that was uh, in that whole space. Uh, similar exactly. to the way that I actually came to Microsoft. Oh, oh nice. exactly the same story. That's awesome. Yeah, that's um, the way to do it. I love it. Where's a great place for somebody that wants to get started and learn more about this? Where can they go? Yeah. So, you know, the typical answer I would say, you know, of course, there's the documentation. Um, but honestly, for me, I'm a much more interactive learner. And so I think things like um, our YouTube channel. So if you find the Viverica, V-E-R-V-E-R-I-C-A uh, YouTube channel, um, that's going to have just a plethora of different talks available. Um, conferences, uh, if you are looking for some upcoming, I'll be at KubeCon and at All Things Open. And so uh, we'll have a booth at KubeCon and then I'll be giving a talk at All Things Open. So we're at a lot of different conferences. And I think one of the things that personally I enjoy the most is meetups because mm -hmm. you'll get a really interesting variety of different use case talks. And then there's always mingling before and after. Yeah. Um, there's a very active, like we've actually sometimes had to shorten the talks because the question answer uh, session is so active in there. And so um, if you really want to kind of jump right in, get your questions answered and talk to, I mean, we have people like the original founders giving talks. We have people at Netflix and Apple and like all these big companies giving talks. And so it's, it's a cool way to actually connect pretty quickly with um, some pretty big people in, in the community there. Oh, there's some, so there's some big companies that are using this product. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you've, uh, I, since uh, you and I met in Grand Rapids, Michigan a couple months ago, you've been traveling a lot. Yeah. And, and you do a lot of this speaking at meetups and mm -hmm. conferences. Yeah. 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 That's, that's uh, a lot of what I do. Is there uh, anything we haven't covered that you feel like we should? I think that was, that was a great amount of uh, information. Yeah. And I think definitely, yeah, as, as you mentioned, like for getting started, I would tell people definitely just jump right into uh, things like meetups and everything. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you're looking to start directly with Flink, like you're like, Hey, you know, meetups are great. I want to meet people, but first I want to like, just get my hands dirty and get in there. Again, Flink SQL is just a super easy way to go from nothing, even if you're not familiar with stream processing whatsoever, to having a data pipeline in like three steps. Um, so I would say that's a fun and very satisfying way to get started too. Excellent. Well, Kato, I really appreciate it. I knew literally nothing about Apache Flink before I met you. And I feel like I'm smarter for having known you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on here. This was awesome. Thank you so much for being my friend in technology. This was awesome, thank you.